for exchange International. Hi folks, welcome to the electronic shop here at Keyboard Exchange International in sunny Sanford, Florida. I'm Jim Huss and I wanted to give you all a progress report about this unbelievably beautiful solid black walnut custom built B3 case. This was not made at the Hammond factory. This was made by Amish craftsmen in uh, Pennsylvania or Ohio. We're not sure which state, but it was by definitely Amish craftsmen. We have all the rest of the wooden parts, and right now we have uh, the entire set of parts that are going to be installed into this wooden case and the tone generator which I'm pointing at right now has been recapped and it's been modified to factory specifications there were some uh, uh, alterations and upgrades that the factory recommended so we've recapped it we've upgraded the tone generator and our senior technician who will uh, follow my brief introduction, will tell you in great detail exactly what has been done to that tone generator, because when we put all these rebuilt parts into this exceptionally beautiful case and special because it's custom, then we want whoever gets it to be fully aware of all that went into it. Now I should add that when we refinish an organ, and we have all the parts out of it, that's the best time to get the tone generator on the bench, get the keyboards on another bench, have sometimes two different technicians, one working on the tone generator, one working on the keyboards and doing the bus ride cleaning and, and all that, all that stuff, key combs and upfelts. This is where it happens. It's like a bare bones, down to the frame restoration. Now we didn't refinish this case. This came to us as raw wood. But, in, in a situation where a case needs to be made ebony or refinished walnut because it got scratched up along the way, then it's the same process. All the parts have to come out before it goes to the refinisher, and then, while the parts are out, we do a marvelous job, and this is kind of like a demonstration and or evidence, if you might want to say, of what gets done on a total restoration when we do a refinish. So we do offer our refinishing services uh, re uh, only if you're doing a full internal restoration at the same time. But most of this work is done to organs that we've acquired and we might want to make them perfect for whoever puts it in a new home. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to fade out of this picture and magically our senior technician is going to appear. Well, hello everyone. My name is Grant here at Keyboard Exchange International. Uh, apparently the magic of Jim's snapping fingers wasn't quite as quick as, uh, as he had hoped build a panorama of the generator just after that. But uh, here we are, as magical as ever. Um, I just wanted to go into a little more detail about how we calibrate the uh, capacitors as we recap a generator and then of course the magnets sometimes need recalibration as well. Uh, in the original factory at Hammond, they had bins similar to this, but probably much larger, where you had a bunch of the same value cap divided into little boxes where they had measured each cap with a voltmeter, and we did that here, not a voltmeter, but a capacitance meter, I should say, and we measured each cap, so 
we have several, you know, in these six boxes, these are all 0.1 caps, but some of them are above 0.099. I have a group here that are 0.097 to 0.098 and so forth. So we put them into smaller groups because there is some variability between them. Back in the 40s and 50s when they were doing this, the variability was much greater. So they had a whole bunch of different bins. Um, it was maybe plus or minus 20%. In today's uh, manufacturing, they don't vary that widely. So what we have uh, are the divided up capacitors, and uh, we're going to use a, or we used, Bill did this generator already, we used a capacitance decade box this time. This makes things a bit easier than just trial and error with different capacitors. But basically what you do is, uh, this is, this acts like a big variable capacitor where I can switch in all different levels of capacitance until we find the exact level that we want. And the way we do that is first we test every output on the generator. On the back here we have 91 terminals. We test all of them with a multimeter uh, using it on the millivolt setting and we get a reading on what the curve looks like before we start. And by curve I mean something like this on this paper you can see. This is something close to the ideal curve that was used uh, for certain vintages of organs. The, on the left you see the bass notes, they're much louder than everything else, the first octave, and then it drops down and you have a curve that goes from low frequency to high frequency. It's not a flat um, line, it's a curve. So that's what we're looking for at the end of this. Uh, prior to starting, we check all of the outputs and we write them down on a piece of paper so we have an idea. This is the ending outputs that we ended up with uh, in this particular case. But um, we do all of that. Then we start, uh, it doesn't matter where you start exactly, but um, you start by taking a capacitor off and the old capacitors look something like this. This is a, a, a paper and wax capacitor. This one is a 0.1 or some, something close to it. This one is probably, in reality nowadays, a 0.8. We measured a bunch of these as we took them off and they were really, really high. They drifted a long way in the uh, 70 years that this organ has been played. So we take this out, then we connect with a couple of jumpers to this box and this takes the place of the old capacitor. And then we start switching in more or less capacitance and we watch the output using our multimeter in millivolts and we switch these until we can achieve the highest possible output from the uh, multimeter. That tells us where it should be, what capacitance we should have on each particular note. And you have to do this for all 91, actually not all 91, you do it for, what is it, 49 to 91 because the early, the, the lower frequencies don't have any kind of filtering on them. But uh, anyway, so Bill did all of this, uh, switched these in and out until he found exactly the right capacitance. Then we go to the box here where we have all of our uh, divvied up capacitors and we pull them out and check them again on the multimeter and see what their actual capacitance is and we add two together. In a lot of cases, you can see down here on the generator, you've got these piggybacked to get the exact capacitance that we're looking for. Once we have that, we solder that on and then we move on to the next one. Now, this curve over here I was just showing you, this is one I got from, uh, from the internet. This is what someone measured on their organ after doing a full recap. And uh, this is kind of an amalgamation of a bunch of recaps, in fact, that came to uh, several technicians settling on this curve being pretty much ideal for, uh, for their listening pleasure, I should say. <laughs> But underneath here is one that I plotted out on a previous generator that I did. Uh, this was after the recap, and you can see the, the lower frequencies here, which we didn't touch actually. There are no caps on these lower frequencies. Those are quite high, then it drops down, and we have these that stick out in the middle, and I'll explain that in a second. But it comes down and it comes back up a little bit. There's, there should be a little bit of an arc, but a bunch of these are a little bit low. So what we ended up doing at the end of it was we had to adjust all these outliers that are that are a bit too low to uh, like this one down here um, to bring those frequencies back in line. Otherwise you get kind of a lumpy frequency response as you move up the chromatic scale. Certain notes are a little bit louder than others. Now the ones that are sticking up there that are really high, 
those were in a very narrow range of notes um, that originally had, they were the first notes in the frequency range that had any kind of filtration on them. Um, so they had a transformer initially, and we had to take that out of the loop and put a different filter on it um, to filter out some unwanted crosstalk. And this is a, uh, a procedure that was brought about in the mid-60s. They discovered that a lot of people, I guess, were complaining that they heard a lot of crosstalk in some of the lower frequencies. Originally, the filters, um, the capacitance filters, were only on pitches 49 to 91. So then they added some transformers just in this area. I think it's like 44 to 48. Um, and that filtered some of that un unwanted stuff. But what we end up doing, or what they started doing in the 60s, is adding a little LC filter going back to, I think, pitch 38 or 37. So they do 37 through 49 with a uh, a modern filter and you remove the transformers that were on 44 to 48 and then you recap all of these up here. So we end up with something that's a little louder because we removed a transformer and replaced it with something that um, was a little less, uh, has, lo has a lower impedance than the original transformer uh, did. So those for sure have to be adjusted with magnets. You recalibrate things with the magnets once you're all done with this. And if you want to pan back down, Bill, to the generator, you can see all these magnets sticking out the end. And they're sticking out the other side over here by the terminals as well. And these magnets can be adjusted closer or further away, but it's a very, very difficult procedure and dangerous because you do kind of want to do it with the generator turning. And if you hit one of the wheels, you'll start chipping away at the teeth on it, and it, it can be, you can ruin the generator. So I don't recommend it for anybody that, that uh, is faint of heart or has a, a bit uh, fiddly fingers, let's say. So, uh, so that is taken care of. I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a graph of what, what this looked like when I was all finished. I just found these uh, a few minutes ago. But, uh, but we flattened the whole thing out and got rid of that big peak there in the middle. And it ended up with a curve very similar to this one that I showed you at first. So in a nutshell, that is the procedure. And uh, it sounds very, very easy. <laughs> and it's not really that hard, but it sounds pretty easy. But it takes quite a long time, hours and hours and hours, and a lot of dedication. Uh, but uh, we, we've been getting a lot of good comments about uh, technical things that we talk about with the organs and uh, so Jim asked me to to get in more detail with this one as to how the procedure goes and so I hope you enjoyed it and learned something and if you have questions or you have comments or suggestions of something I missed maybe uh, that that you out there know about uh, please leave them in the comments below and uh, have a great day thanks for watching our video and thank you also for uh, helping keep the ham and tone wheel b3 organ alive we couldn't do all this work that we do here without you and it would also help greatly if you could subscribe like uh, ask for notifications for when we have new videos that would be a big help for us so we thank you once again i'm signing off for now but we will be back